In our last video, we covered the identities and origins of the various Germanic peoples that would come to call the island of Britain home. We left the question, however, how and why did the Anglo-Saxons come to not only settle, but entirely dominate both England and much of what is today Scotland? Before we can ask how the Anglo-Saxons came to dominate Britain, we must ask why. Believe it or not, people do not just decide to pick up their entire livelihoods and migrate a vast distance, especially at a time in which a Saxon in continental Europe could hardly Google their future home, instead only knowing of it through word of mouth and folk history. Migration was a great risk, not only insofar as your destination being a largely unknown and somewhat mystical land, but also because, in the case of Britain, there was a large population already living there, who may not have been so eager to give you and your family quite the hospitality you would wish, with historians estimating anywhere from 2 to 4 million living in Britain in the 3rd and 4th centuries. With this in mind, what did drive these continental Germanic speakers into picking up their belongings, boarding a ship and braving the unknown? Firstly, we must expand the scope of our questioning. The real question here isn't so much why these Germanic people settled in Britain, but rather, why they migrated all across Europe. The Germanic migrations were vitally not just restricted to the Anglo-Saxons and Britain. We must remember that the settlement of Britain by the Anglo-Saxons occurred at the same time as the fall of the Western Roman Empire. These two events are not coincidental. They share the same cause. Historians are not certain of much, given the lack of sources left by the Germanic migrators. Yet, it is theorised by most historians that a great weather event struck Europe during the 5th century CE, causing widespread crop failures in much of northern and central Europe. This forced a large wave of Germanic peoples to descend southwards and westwards across Europe, pushing the Roman Empire back and causing the disintegration of their strength and borders. At the same time, the Roman province of Britannia, already abandoned by Rome due to mounting costs and difficulties defending the region against the Picts from Scotland, then Caledonia, was not only extremely arable and fertile, but also defended by a series of weak states struggling to survive without the assistance from their former Roman overlords. This is not to say that they were poor or isolated, a common misconception. We have evidence of trade with places as far away as Byzantium, in fact, it is hypothesised that trade became more egalitarian during the later years of the empire in Britain, with currency for the first time being found in rural communities. Instead of a society of the early empire, a society of poor Celtic peoples being dominated yet not mixing with their Roman overlords, the late empire in Britain was marked by a rural population that seemed to adopt Roman customs and, importantly, Roman coin. The Romano-Britons were unable to field large armies, however, and as such, hired mercenaries to fight their wars against their Celtic neighbours, but also each other. And who better to hire as fighters than a people as renowned as the barbaric Germanic peoples of Northern Europe, ones who turned to becoming mercenaries in vast numbers due to their own difficult conditions back home. Upon coming to Britain, realising the weak state of the locals, splendid climate and fertile lands, one could hardly blame a man for having ideas to simply take it all for himself. This is exactly what these mercenaries would do. The first reliable records of Germanic peoples living in Britain can be found in the Roman times. The Romans, especially in the later empire period, bolstered their armies with vast numbers of auxiliary soldiers from across the empire, yet also sometimes beyond. These somewhat mercenaries, known as Thedorati, were integral to the legions, and a great many were from tribes that bordered the Roman empire. The Romans, seeking to place these men into a climate they would somewhat be familiar with, positioned a great many of these in Britain, and, after completing their service, many would choose to stay and live on the island. Others would return to their tribes, telling tales of the temperate climate and excellent soil quality for farming, along with the weak nature of the Roman Empire in Britain itself. Once the Roman Empire left Britain, these post-Roman states, often city-states, would continue to hire the same people from Europe as the Romans had. At the same time, Germanic speakers from Europe began to settle and displace Romano-British locals. This culminated in 442 CE with a large-scale rebellion of these Germanic peoples, displacing many of their Romano-British overlords in parts of England. 
This can be observed in writings of the time, with the Chronica Gallica of 452 detailing how in 451 CE, the British provinces, which to this time had suffered various defeats and misfortunes, had been reduced to Saxon rule. In reality, however, the history was more nuanced, and while a revolt most probably did happen, it was unlikely to have been one single great event, instead being far more regionally nuanced. Historians are now largely settled on two main competing methods of migration and settlement, so just how did the Anglo-Saxons come to settle and displace their Romano-British predecessors? Historian Toby Martin describes how in the south and east, the populations of the Romano-British were largely entirely overwhelmed and displaced, being placed into slavery or exile by the settling Saxons and Jutes. In the case of the Kingdom of Kent, the Jutes settled primarily in the east of the county by around 449 CE, notably after the supposed Saxon rebellion. This indicates that while the initial Germanic settlers were probably Germanic mercenaries, a much greater wave of migration occurred within a few decades afterwards, overwhelming what remained of Romano-Britain civilization. Of note is that while in the south and east the Germanic people seemed to have completely displaced the Romano-Britons, they did not entirely remove all traces of them. Many Roman-style developments continued to be built, with urban centres featuring sewage and complex central heating systems being built in post-Saxon and Jute migration settlements for some time. In addition, many places in the south and east are evolutions of their Roman ancestral names, which in turn are almost always Latinized forms of their Celtic ancestor names. For example, Canterbury being a modern derivation of the Old English Cantware, meaning Kentish person, itself from the Latin Civitas Cantica, in turn from the Old Celtic Cantium, meaning the edge of the land, added with Bury, meaning a fortified city, a common suffix used in place names in England and Scotland, as well as a cognate of a German Berg, as seen in places like Hamburg. In the north, however, the Romano-Britons appear to have intermingled somewhat and integrated with the new societal structures created by the Germanic migrators. While this is not to say that the Romano-Britons were not enslaved, exiled or outright slaughtered, it appears to at least some degree the process was less extreme than in the south. What we do know is that by the 450s CE, England was mostly under the control of these Germanic peoples. Gone were the remnant Romano-British states, and instead the land was dotted with a complex network of Germanic speakers, identifying as different tribes, kinship groups and war bands. This intricate yet barbaric society had destroyed the Romano-British culture, which valued things as bureaucracy, the separation of military and civilian spheres of life, and a currency-based economy. It would appear that in the space of only a few decades, a fairly prosperous yet perilously positioned Romano-Britain Britain had been plunged back hundreds of years. Unfortunately, just how and why the Germanic migrators won out, and how they actually went about changing the societal fabric of Britain, is largely a mystery that even today we know very little about. We know almost nothing of the religion that these people followed, with what we do know being inferred from similarities with the Norse pantheon, and we know almost as little about their societal composition and makeup. To make matters worse, they hardly wrote at all. And while later chroniclers such as Bede would explain much, we cannot be too sure in what they say being accurate, given much of their own information was from word of mouth legends and stories. The sad truth in this is, all we really know is that some point from around the 400s to the 450s, the Romano-Britons consistently lost land and power to the Anglo-Saxons. Eventually, the Germanic society would codify and become more established, with a clear hierarchical structure and the creation of what we can term states, that being areas under the control of one person with entrenched structures, such as tax systems, militaries, and in some cases, vast urban centres. Fortunately, this next era in the history of the Anglo-Saxons is somewhat more documented and less hypothesised. Join us next time in our next episode in this series, The Formation of the Heptarchy. As always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more great historical content and future videos on this very topic. Be sure to check out our Discord and Patreon, linked in the description below.